No. I'm not worried at all. I rely on God, Allah. بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I'd like to welcome everybody to today's Life Hub podcast Today we have a very special guest with us uh, He is a cultural and critical clinical psychologist uh, He's also a lecturer uh, at uh, Middlesex University uh, He's a uh, somebody who's actually written many articles uh, and in regards to uh, racialization of Muslims and counterterrorism policies and so forth. And uh, he deals, he has extensive uh, knowledge and history experience dealing with the Muslim community. And so without further ado, I would like to welcome Dr. Tariq Yunus to the Life Hub podcast. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alaikum salam wa barakatuh. Jazakumullah khair for uh, for inviting me and for having me. Jazakumullah khair for taking the time. Uh, you are a, um, I want to say current Canadian abroad, but I don't, I don't know if it's a former Canadian, a current Canadian living abroad, but uh, you've lived a significant portion of your life in Canada, Germany, United Kingdom, Uh, so you have uh, a lot of experience in the Western world, and uh, you uh, moved to uh, United Kingdom in 2017, correct? That's right. It was that before or after the uh, Quebec mosque shooting? I left actually shortly after the Quebec mosque shooting. I was actually one of the speakers at... Uh, At uh, one of the uh, at one of the genezas that was uh, organized by uh, by the state, so to speak. Okay. All right, Khair uh, Michelle, I'm I'm gonna I want to get into some of the issues um, uh, in regards to uh, Islamophobia in Quebec um, in a bit, but firstly, I just want to get right into it because as um, Muslims living in Western countries, many of us are born and raised in these countries. We don't know. Um, any other country to call home. That This is our home. We may have visited other ancestral lands, but really our roots are here within Canada. Mm. And uh, there's been a question that's uh, daunted uh, practicing Muslims who are born and raised here in Canada. And that is... Uh, Any time they try to practice their religion, they're trying to practice their deen um, to the best that they can, they will get some type of this, in some shape or form, a, a certain argument which says, listen, why are you trying to change Canadian society or UK society if you don't like how Western society functions and leave? Mm. Okay. So why are you here in, in Western? So... For example, you can insert anything, like for for example, like shaking hands. Uh, you know, um, in, in Islam, to you know, to uh, you know, you, you don't want to shake hands of the opposite gender, you know, so freely. And so uh, that's that's been an issue that's that's been brought up. Oh, you know, if you're against shaking hands, then get out of this country, right? Yeah. So. Uh, I want to get right into it. Like that's, I think there's a lot of cool things that we can talk about, a lot of uh, ways of looking at issues that hopefully can um, squeeze the mind grapes of the audience. So um, what, do you, what do you have to say in regards to that? Yeah, mashallah, you're jumping straight into, uh, into the heat, so to speak. Um, yeah. I just want to say, you know, first of all, uh, may Allah have mercy on all those who passed away at the Quebec uh, shooting uh, and give justice to all those who are oppressed around the world um, so yeah that's it's funny when when people say that um, I find it especially funny when Muslims make that argument you know why don't you just leave if you're uncomfortable here yeah and um, I mean there's so many problems with that sort of rhetoric uh, and there's a lot of different ways of approaching it but I think the one that's perhaps most 
egregious or the one that's most insulting, really, is that in making that statement, it's actually, I mean, it's reproducing the sort of um, the sort of rhetoric that Muslims don't belong here, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I mean, to be able to tell someone, well, why don't you go back home or why don't you leave the country, it immediately presumes that this isn't their country or this isn't their place, right? Mm-hmm. And it reproduce it that inherently what. Um, what Islamophobia is really about, right? I mean, among the various rhetorics is that if we think about from a historical perspective, you know, the West versus the rest, you know, Western being large, uh, you know, racialized as white, you know, rest being people who are non-white. And so people who are non-white are either like, you know, they're either visitors or they were brought against their will, but they don't actually belong to the concept of the nation. Um, and so you'd rarely, or if not, it's, you know, it just never happens that, you know, a white person would be, uh, would be challenged with that argument. Um, so there is already that, but I mean, it's, I, I think one of the funniest things about that, that type of statement is that uh you know it just it, it, it it's it's such it's such a it's such an insult i think to to how people just experience you know the world itself right i mean yes. so many people just don't have that sort of relationship to any other place besides where their family is etc so it reproduces a reality that you just don't belong and your your experiences don't really matter. Um, yes, it's sort of just a get out of here type of thing, um, and it, it really belongs to a, a very nationalistic way of looking at the world. Yeah, because I think some European countries, just to use that as a real life example, the shaking hands issue. Certain yeah. university, uh, or sorry, certain European countries uh, have uh, made it mandatory, like unless you shake the hands of whoever is giving you your citizenship, then you're not going to get your citizenship, right? So they become yeah, yeah. much more strict on that if you don't go uh, swimming. So if you don't declothe and, you know, do your the whole swimming program, uh, then you could possibly uh, not get credit to pass, you know, the that particular grade. So they've uh, made it uh, like a big cultural issue, you know, and uh, I think the rhetoric, I, I feel the, the rhetoric, the attitude, the atmosphere has changed a lot because I remember even myself, I went to public school. So I've been to non-Muslim public school, grew up in Canada, born and raised. And uh, if you wanted to opt out, say, in dancing, so like they'd have a dance class, you know, as part of, you know, physical education. You could do that. There was no problem with it whatsoever. And they would not make you feel uncomfortable at all for not being part of this class. Mm. Or sexual education, if you wanted to opt out of that. Uh, you, it was very like straightforward. Okay, yeah, just get assigned by your parents. You're opting out. You're going to go do like a research project or something in the library. You know? Yeah. So yeah. there were way more, I think, uh, culturally welcoming and sensitive, I felt, uh, in uh, you know the 80s, 90s. Until obviously, you know, we saw uh, early 2000 where Islamophobia really took off. But uh, it, it was a, mo- a much more accepting type of environment because, as you mentioned, I think logically, like if you were to ask somebody and say, listen, has uh, Western societal norms remained constant? Has it been constant? Like has fashion remained constant? Has societal norms remained constant? And yeah. I think one can ask is like, no, then who has the right? Like, does that mean Muslims don't have a voice in what you've described as this pluralistic liberal democracy? Do we not have a voice? Because we've seen, for example, now with COVID-19, which is very interesting. Now, nobody's shaking hands. You know what I mean? Nobody's world leaders are doing this, you know, this weird elbow thing and they're not even coordinated doing that. And uh, so they're doing this. Uh, they're not shaking hands. Um, with the whole Me Too uh, movement or this Me Too campaign, yeah. just touching somebody became a big issue. Oh, we should get consent. All of a sudden now, 
my body, I have the right to who touches it rather than no, you must allow somebody to touch you uh, in a friendly manner. You, you understand what I'm saying? So I see a, uh, some a level of differentiation and, and hypocrisy here. So would you consider this uh, type of attitude or these type of statements uh, to uh, to be Islamophobic? Would you, would you mm. say that? Because they, it's not like they would, uh, other people, other groups seem, no, okay, they, they have the ability to lobby maybe for their values, their input into the, you know, cultural zeitgeist, so to speak. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, that's a really fantastic question. And subhanAllah, it just made me think of perhaps one of the most important points I didn't really uh, say when, uh, when you asked the question. And I, and I was just thinking about it. If we want to really think about Islamophobia, mm. I mean, to respond to what you're saying, you know, I think the problem is that we often think about Islamophobia in terms of intent rather than mm. in terms of consequence. Mm. And conceptualize Islamophobia in terms of consequence is that Muslims are depoliticized. What do I mean when, Muslim, when I say Muslims are depoliticized? It means we can't engage things on our own terms, right? As a Muslim community, um, we have potentially, just as anyone else, technically the same political rights to engage society, to, 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 make, to have a say in society, right? In how, you know, whatever, how society should be and how it should be run, and et cetera. Right? But mm. the effect of Islamophobia is that Muslims are either completely apprehensive of engaging in anything politically, or if they are engaging politically, then they're really sort of, you know, they're cordoned off to, to really just align by like certain party politics, right? Be it like labor, whatever it might be, you know, conservative. Mm. Um, it's not one in which they're able to engage society based on their own values. Mm. And I think this is one of the, the sort of the impacts of Islamophobia we see uh, that we often talk about. This is depoliticization, this fear of, okay, can I, can I speak my mind, you know, that I have an issue potentially with something? Um, because ultimately, the moment someone says, well, I have an issue, let's say, with shaking hands, it raises that it raises that that point automatically. Well, potentially you don't belong here. You see, this mm. idea of you don't belong here immediately depoliticizes the person, right? Mm. They don't belong to a society where, hey, can we have a discussion about mm. a system of values, you know, a multicultural system of values potentially, where we can we can all live together cohesively. Mm. Right. Mm -hmm. And then you brought up COVID and that's actually a fantastic, that's a fantastic way of showing how, which system of values are prioritized to be able to make a change in society. You know, the register that people will listen to are like, you know, whatever medical scientific registers, even though technically we can't see the germs or anything, but that's a register we're going to believe, you know, there's a leap of faith when I'm shaking your hand, you know, we can't, I'm not looking at your hand. I can see like that there's a virus there. I just have that faith. That this mm. is going to protect me, right? And and it's not like uh, you absolutely have the virus. It's just a better chance of me not getting it. So it's not even an absolute uh, safety precaution. You know Precisely. I mean? Precisely. So I mean, it goes to show again, if we're thinking about it in terms of the impact, you know, it shows that Muslims are depoliticized. You know, mm. and it it also goes it brings it back to why is this happening in the first place. Why, why is it that that question even appears, you know, go back to your own country, you know, or questions of handshaking, you know, at citizenship registrations. Why is that happening in the first place? And it's increasing. It's increasing across the global north. And it's something I always try to, I'm trying to bring to as much attention uh, as possible to others, to other people are doing as well. You know, these issues of niqab, you know, bans and all these moral panics with regards to the Muslims. Mm. comes actually back down to to questions of of nationalism we see nationalist discourse um and rhetoric 
you know, being German, being, you know, being English, etc., has gotten a lot of political clout uh, over the last few years, over the last few decades. You know, that, that golden era of what we imagine multiculturalism to be back in the 90s um, is long, long gone now. You know, here in, in the UK, David yeah. Cameron spoke about muscular liberalism. And he mentioned yeah. that specifically with regards to Muslims. Yeah. It had, it's these nationalist overtones that, okay, you know, um, we need to focus on a group to be able to consolidate who we are, we need to focus on who we're not. You know, for mm. me to be able to consolidate, you know, in a, in a state of weakness or insecurity, well, what does it mean to be British? Well, let me, let me point at someone else and say, you know, those people historically were not British and they're mm. still not British. So it's easier to mobilize and unite people uh, with hatred rather than perhaps um, even common principles, right? Like out of the, the hatred or fear, you could probably galvanize more people faster than you can based on, uh, say, your altruistic values and principles. Absolutely. I mean, I don't think hatred, I think hatred is the effect. I think it's yeah. just through sheer difference, right? It's existing yeah. through difference. Is What is... Our nation, except that we can draw upon like long standing imagination that, oh, being British was being white. You know, that's mm. what it was. You know, being German was being white. Yeah, Germany is actually a really good example. You know, until very recently, um, Germany had a very, uh, had an ethnocentric way of giving citizenship, which meant that if you were German, um, regardless of where you were born in the world, if you were ethnically German, you'd get its citizenship. Whereas Turks, who are like second, third, fourth generation, born in, Tur uh, born in Germany, um, were never naturalized. They were never given citizenship. Mm -hmm. And in fact, one of the killers of Marwa Sherbini um, was a killer who took a knife in court and stabbed uh, our sister Marwa, Allah um, And... Uh, killed both her and her, she was pregnant at the time, and her baby. He, uh, he was German, but he wasn't born in Germany. He was actually, he was from Russia. Mm. Uh, but he had a German citizenship. And see, I think there's, there's just these long-standing histories um, all over, really, um, that, that raise this point of, of, of nationalism being inherently the issue, you know, mm -hmm. and that brings, that puts Muslims in what position, you know, then you, you brought up, you know, let's do a full circle now back. Why are Muslims even raising that question of like, well, why don't you be Canadian or get out of here? It's because they've, they've, they've assumed this, you know, they've, they've mm -hmm. taken on that conflict that being Muslim or not from here, not being white and Canadian has this inherent conflict. So they're kind of like, you know, they're, they're almost policing, you know, as a function of, of, the, of that nationalist logic, right? Like, mm. they're, they're playing that role in yeah. Eric, you know? Like, white people aren't yeah. talking to each other in such a way, you know, yeah. either <laughs> correspond to our values, even, yeah. even racist. You know, race, yeah. I mean, white people, let's pretend, like, whatever, we're both white, right? Yeah. And you're super racist towards black yeah. No one would ever say to you, oh, you're not Canadian. You know, that's yeah. just, it's the type of rhetoric that doesn't come up and it just shows yeah. how much we've, we've assumed this sort of logic. Do you think part of it is that our community does have such a significant portion that are immigrants, so they don't have the self-confidence and, and um, the, uh, c you know, comfort level to say, hey, I am from here, whereas like, you know, myself maybe being born here, I'm, I'm more willing to challenge uh, the system, but then there's no cohesion within our community. Like, you know, other people are saying, hey, be quiet, be quiet, sit down, sit down. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. You, that, that's a really good point, I think. Um, and it just goes to show, again, I think the issue with talking about Muslims as a monolith, right? I think, um, yeah. especially in Europe, but also, I mean, we know in Canada and Quebec, there's definitely an increasing number of migrants and refugees. Yeah. Um, I, I think that obviously has a, that plays a role, but, 
I think Islamophobia in terms of its um, where it comes from, if we're talking about nationalism as being inherently an issue, which uh, through political discourse, you know, people are just going to keep focusing on Muslims. Um, that's one way of depoliticizing anyone. You know what I mean? I mean, it doesn't even make yeah. a difference. And if you think about the Turkish, um, the, the Turkish population in Germany as an example, mm. I mean, they were obviously depoliticized, I mean, but in a, in a very explicit way, you know, I mean, they didn't, they literally didn't get passports, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, we don't have to, we don't have to use that as a benchmark. I think it happens along different registers, but, you know, I think among a lot of brothers and sisters, they, especially, um, for you and I, you know, people who are born and raised in Canada, where we might not have that that option, even like literally, we don't have an option to move back. <laughs> you know, like yeah, I think, yeah you know, exactly. You, you know how go it is, back like, where, man? Go back where? <laughs> exactly. Nobody's gonna give me like you know. And the same for I, I should say. You know? I should say the same for refugees and uh, many migrants as well, right? I mean, yeah, exactly. Like not, where are they going to? Exactly, you're you're absolutely correct. And yeah. and 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 I believe this issue um, uh, is uh, selective because I remember uh, one of my um, uh, uh, employees mentioning how uh, there was, uh, and, and she's originally from France, so she emigrated to um, Canada. Mm-hmm. And uh, she actually's pretty good about getting rid of her rid of her accent. She's able to like you know blend in pretty good. So there was another um, Caucasian Canadian talking to her about this Filipino lady that was in their vicinity. She's like, oh, these people they come in and they, you know, they're they're taking all their jobs and they're complaining everything about her to these immigrants, like going off on this immigrant rant. And then she's like, you know, I'm an immigrant too. Like, you know what I mean? Your vision. <laughs> Your your perception of what an immigrant is, you know, is very closely linked, you know, to a person who's non-white, because you're not. You know, we had this, uh, you know, I was mentioning this uh, before, like um, with the whole uh, in a previous podcast with the whole Don Cherry situation. I don't know if you are familiar with that. So uh, you're in Canada, you know, who Don Cherry is right, yeah, yeah. the Canadian broadcast. So, yeah. so he was recently. Um, let go because he said uh, during Remembrance Day, oh, I'm seeing all these immigrants, these people coming and they don't wear poppies, you know, something to that effect. And I said to myself, like, how does he know that they're immigrants? Right. The only yeah. way that he like go and ask these people, like each single person, uh, you know, like, are you, uh, you know, first of all, the idea of what Canadianism is, like you're saying, you come to the, he, he was me. He was even more exaggerated than that. You come to the land of milk and honey, like, you know, you come to this, you should be so grateful, you know, to come here. And, uh, and you don't, you can't even say thank you by wearing a poppy and, and stuff like that. So he, he, he was putting them uh, to task. Like, how do you, how do you know these people are immigrants? Like, uh, how do you know the, the, that they are immigrants? Like, you know, yeah. did you go take a look at this passport? Okay, country born in and, you know, what, what are you looking at, right? Yeah, man. Paula, I mean, th- I think you just hit the nail on the head, man. And you also just very much explained how that's why I'll be honest with you when I'm talking about Muslims as well and racism towards yeah. Muslims. I often introduce or I hope that we speak more about racialization. And by racialization, yes. I mean like Muslims and non-white people are racialized according to these social conflicts, all right? And th- that's one of the definitions of racism that we can hold to, which is one in which certain bodies and behaviors, so certain people become apparent through some social conflicts. And let's use some examples, right? Like the war on drugs, that social conflict is going to make certain bodies more apparent than others, right? The war on terror, the war on immigration, you see? So just the idea of immigrant already conjures up certain bodies over others. And I think um, the example I always love to bring um, to this, because, you know, sometimes people are, may even just deny that one can be racist towards Muslims or that Muslims can be racialized, right? Because that always comes up, right? It's like, what, that's a faith group. How can a faith group yeah. be racialized? Yes. Um, but, you know, I mean, besides the really, I mean, there's <laughs> extensive research, I think someone just really has Racists to Google that. Racists use that all the time, right? They say, yeah. like, Islam is an idea. How can you be racist against an idea? Yeah. You know, that, that's a common argument used by, um, you know, certain haters. That's it. That's it. And the example that I like to give 
I mean, this is a really basic example, but, um, you know, back in the day, I don't remember when, I think it was like around 2010 in New York, there was a, there was a mosque around, um, around uh, the World Trade Center or Ground Zero at the time that, uh, that was already there, but it was being renovated. And it led to this whole like controversy. It was very sensationalized, the Ground Zero Mosque, et cetera. And a lot of people came out to protest because they were saying, how can there be a mosque around Ground Zero? So pay attention to all these registers, right? It's like Muslims, yes. them, they don't belong to national memory. You know, even the Muslims yeah. obviously died in 9-11. But yes. see, that's the point. There's already that rhetoric. So if people are paying attention, they can already see these things. But what was really fascinating to me, actually, what happened was um, these two, I believe it's two Coptic Egyptians, uh, flew down, flew in to join in those protests against the, the building or the renovating of the mosque. And they were beaten up by the crowd. They were beaten yes. up by the crowd, right? Yes. So they're not Muslim. Yeah. But they were, they were in a space where that social yeah. conflict of the war on terror is so pronounced. And yeah. they were racialized as Muslims, obviously, and they were attacked, yes. right? And so, I mean, that also explains then how, our, you know, Sikhs and other people who become, who are racialized as Muslims. I don't know if you, yeah. you know, you saw the movie Inside Man, you know, there's a yeah. Sikh who comes out and then they like pull the turban, the police pull the turban and it's like very yeah. aggressive. And they're like, he's a Muslim. And then, you know, they're just attacking. Yeah. These yeah. are just different ways of trying to understand, well, how are Muslims racialized? The war on terror just being one register, right? The war on immigration, just another register, right? And these are ways of conceptualizing for people. When we're, when we're talking about, you know, the significance of being anti-racist, um, you know, on a, on, a, on, a, like on a national level, what that means, you know, th this is something that's actually well understood, but I think more and more Muslims are really picking up on as well. Yeah, my... my See, what, what I always look at is that, you know, to, contr to try to change the ideas and opinions of other people, that's the most difficult, like the ones that are most furthest to re removed from you. Mm -hmm. You can start with yourself, your family, your community. And that's what I feel in our community. We, we haven't made the path of our empowerment very easy. Like we're not, we're not thinking in that way. You know, sometimes we're the fr no. Non-Muslims will, will give you more of a voice sometimes in your own Muslim community. So, for example, I remember uh, I was giving a khutbah like around the time for elections here in Canada. Mm -hmm. So it, you, you probably remember at that time they were coming out like the, the conservative party was talking about like coming up with this barbaric hotline, like, you know, to cultural barbaric practices hotline. OK, yeah. And uh, they were really, uh, you know, using, politicizing Islamophobia, all that stuff, right? So I was at a masjid where somebody who was an observer from uh, Elections Canada was there uh, at that masjid or somebody who, who takes part in organizing it. And he was a, um, actually a priest, like, so, and he came in in his priest uh, outfit and everything, Okay. And so he's there. And so I gave my uh, khutbah. And, and basically, uh, during the course of the khutbah, I mentioned, like, here, yeah, I'm not going to tell you who to vote for. But I think we all know um, who you shouldn't vote for, right? And it's the one that rhymes with a cut sharper, right? So, <laughs> so, so I'm like, I give, I, I give, uh, you know, I just did this, this. That's all I mentioned in regards to, like, specifically, you know, uh, any type of recommendation. I'm sitting there after the khutbah. This guy comes up to me. He's like, do you represent this masjid? I'm like, um, no. He's a Muslim guy. So this Muslim guy comes up to me. This uncle comes up. He says, do you represent the masjid? I'm like, no. He's like, your khutbah, does it represent the masjid? I'm like, no, it represents my, just myself. And then he said, well, do they know? Is everyone okay with you being against the conservative par party? Like, he started getting upset. That little thing, like, he started getting upset with me. And subhanAllah, like, what was just, at least at that time, was really cool. I had never experienced this before, is when, like, uncles have your back. That's like, <laughs> that's like almost like mafia power. Because all yeah. these uncles are like, what are you talking about? Is nothing wrong with this? And then, like, like about, like, five, like, or ten different, like, 
combination of like Arab and Daisy Uncle just took this guy like he went away, he disappeared. <laughs> I was like, okay. And subhanAllah, the 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 guy from Elections Canada, the Christian uh, priest came up to me and thanked me specifically. He came there, he's like, I, I, I'm, I want to thank you uh, for you, the speech that you gave. He specifically came. But the problem, I was like, why are people from our own community, like a non-Muslim guy who's from a different religion, who's also part of like organizing like, you know, the Elections Canada voting and, and whatnot, came and specifically acknowledged and appreciated uh, what I had to say. And our own people from our own community is trying to come here and and, and make, uh, you know, give me a, a hard time about that. You know what I mean? Yeah. So uh, like, how can we get to our own community to get them to start thinking differently about this you know that we need to um think about politicizing ourselves to giving ourselves that type of right hey we have a voice too we have the right to uh give our input in policy we have a right to uh say what's culturally acceptable and what's not culturally acceptable yeah subhanallah that's a really really good that's a really good point i think um that question lends itself to different different audiences on different levels depending on the country that's listening in for example you know like i think a country like denmark or germany if anyone's listening from there you know i think they they would they would really vibe with that experience because you know even just becoming politically engaged you know at all is something that is rather i guess in a way is rather novel um you know they a lot of the popular muslim populations there come from um working class backgrounds, um, they were they were migrant workers, right? And I think Canada mm. has a mix of, you know, educated, uh, you know, people who come from, you know, um, I guess more like middle class backgrounds from even their countries of origin, where they already understood Islam as one that's naturally uh, sort of politically engaged, right? That we as a community have to have to sort of, we have to become politically engaged. Um, you know, I was just going to actually bring up the UK as an example, because I think Mm. in a way, um, you know, if someone comes and is like, look, just stay out of politics, I'll be honest with you. I mean, those people are, are, are probably already set in different ways. You know what I mean? Like someone who's already saying that they're saying that from, they can be coming from different perspectives, right? They can be coming from like a very like sort of neo-traditionalist perspective uh, yeah. that, uh, that some have been talking about where it's like, look, we just have to be obedient. Uh, you know, don't, don't, rock, don't rock any boats. You know, we're visitors yeah. here. Yeah. Now, again, you and I, uh, or at least myself, I, I have a huge points of contention with that, right? Because yeah. you're, you're really, really not reading the political climate very well. Things are getting worse yeah. and you have to do something. Yes. Now, if anyone already comes to agreement that, yeah, we have to we have to engage politically, I think the UK becomes a good example where there's there's no um, there's no lack of, <laughs> of organizations and people who are trying to become politically engaged. And that's where you enter in a whole range of other discussions like, oh, should we as Muslims throw our eggs in like every party basket, so to speak. You know, you get, like you have Muslims engaging with conservatives, you have Muslims engaging with like, you know, liberal Democrats, etc. Um, you know, you basically have everyone so like a who's who of just like people like, okay, I just want to join this party now and, and see what I can do, you know? Mm. Um, so there's 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 I, I will, I'll tell you right now, I think there's there's definitely a couple of people I can recommend that you invite on this podcast if you want to talk talk specifically about politics and Muslim community. Um, and I can think of several really great people who 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 really trace the trajectory and the history of of these movements and who's done what and what how things have backfired. Um, but the only point I think I'll just say right now is that whatever it is, it has to be a consolidated. Muslim community effort, you know, like mm. us together as a community. I think that's that's the strength. You know, the strength of any movement really comes in solidarity. And this isn't something that's really this that's not a controversial thing to say. I mean, even people like Noam Chomsky or other people have written and spoken about this. You know, like it's about us being together and recognizing, okay, 
we're going to do something together, right? Like as a, as a community, we're going to sort of mobilize on a particular issue uh, or with a political party, whatever it might be. Um, my only point that I want to say right now, at least just in terms of the discussion, is that I have a big problem eventually with what happens, with, which is that Muslims are taking this very, it's a very modern way of sort of experiencing politics, is that, okay, I'm just going to do my own thing. You know, like I'm going to become a yeah. engaged on my own. I'm going to go join that party on my own or do this on my own. You know what I mean? Or like somehow, you know, whatever, you know, like I'm going to vote my way, you know, come voting time rather mm-hmm. as like, okay, I'm voting as part of a collective. And how do we understand that as being part of a community, being part of a collective that's, you know, that's working towards all, all our interests combined? Um, I think that's something that becomes a lot more challenging. Um, but again, I can think of people who could talk about this a little bit more, but anyone listening in, you know, if you if you want to become politically engaged, I mean, you got to get with a crew, you know, you got to get with a community. You know, there's a lot of some organizations in Canada, you know, don't just do it on your own, you know, become mm-hmm. part of become a part, something greater than yourself and see see what the history is and, you know, read on what the mistakes were. And that's how we're going to move forward. Mm-hmm. Uh, I feel uh because there are obviously uh, Muslim politicians out there, people, uh, I, I, I think there needs to be some key um, characteristic traits for anybody who will make any type of benefit for, you know, uh, Muslims. Uh, one of which, obviously, after loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is you have to love your community. All the different people in it, you know what I mean? Yeah. Because some people, someone might go in there and and let's be honest, like the the people who are going to be running in politics, they're going to lean more towards like the modernist type of maybe ideas and stuff like that, uh, and maybe um, a, a, a away from the traditional. Now, maybe that person could have a benefit for the community, but they need to have love for the whole community. They have to have love for the person who is a traditionalist and has certain, uh, you know, Islamic values that they're trying to preserve and practice and whatnot, and be able to advocate with them just as passionately as they would for personal issues that they feel, you know, uh, that they care about a lot. You know what I mean? Absolutely, yeah, man. I think you hit the nail on the head. And that li- that that really links to, like, my research, if we think about, like, counter-extremism. I mean, think about Muslims right now, right now, at least in the UK, and I think increasingly across the Western world, um, if a Muslim comes and says, you know, I'm a counter extremist, you know, they're immediately given political clout. I mean, in our, in our, in, in, in our, you know, in the state of our climate, our political climate, they're, they're given political clout immediately, right? And they may be thinking that they're doing this, let's say in the UK, you know, on behalf of the community, right? Oh, um, you know, Politicians are going to give me, I'm, I'm going to have doors open for me by, by you know, by whatever, procre- proclaiming a sort of counter-extremism position. Um, but really, it's incredibly detached from any of the, like, what the major organizations here in the UK are calling for, right? Like, you, you have to be detached in such a way that immediately you're almost put at odds you know, with, um, with what, like, you know, m- many of the major organizations have been talking about, that no, we don't agree, we don't with, agree with counter-extremism, counter-extremism policies because they hurt the community, you know, that, that's the end of the discussion, right? And just because there's political clout in proclaiming that, as you were saying, there's a moral boundary there. You know, there has to be a moral boundary whereby, you know, no, we're not going to engage in that, you know, or let's say engage or, you know, I mean, like in in many of the sort of other um, whatever, let's say institutions of like the military industrial complex, you know, like we're not going to become like military generals so that we have political yeah. clout. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, yeah. it, it sounds it sounds weird, but, you know, I think. I think people do think that, 
You know, I think people do think we need to take every single opportunity we have. But in a way, that's exactly the opposite of, of being grassroots. You know, that's just pandering to like all these political, like politically manufactured moral panics, you know, mm-hmm. constantly pandering to them rather than like, look, we're a community, we have a say in a society, you know, and we can do so collectively. And you know what? Like, even if we were to somehow agree that there could be a definition of extremism, which there isn't, but let's pretend just like in, the, in our wildest imaginations that we can define that. Um, you know, maybe that's the least of our issues. You know, that's, maybe that's just the completely least of our issues. Maybe we need, you know, look, we want better, we want more public spending on like, you know, whatever, housing, you know, whatever, mental health, things like that. Maybe those are the things that matter to us. Mm. And so for a Muslim to somehow just come up and be like, look, okay, you know, I got a foot in right now and I'm going to become like whatever mayor or something based on that position of counter extremism. In a way, we can already see how that hurts the community more because Mm. now the sort of political clout, you know, it becomes... um, becomes like a vicious circle, right? Because other people then see that, okay, you know, it's given that sort of, um, that value. That it's it, also, I think, uh, lends more legitimacy to a certain narrative. Right? Yeah. Because, uh, you know, we have, oh, look, we have people from their own community uh, who have now joined forces with us because uh, they believe in what we're doing. Yeah. One thing I think um, people... Um, fail to recognize maybe even our own community is the great hidden damage that a lot of this counter extremism, um, you know, surveillance type of culture and policy uh, is doing to our community. Like how many times have you sat like in a restaurant and somebody's like, Oh, they might be listening. Like, Oh, do you understand what I'm yeah. saying? People yeah. think they're being listened to all the time, man. Yeah. And like it's – or people say, oh, be careful. Like a parent telling their kid, oh, don't talk like that or don't say something. Like subhanAllah, like imagine the, the type of, um, you, you know, mental state, you know, that it puts a person in to always be in a state of anxiety, you yeah. know, to, to, to feel like this. Uh, there is um, a brother – who actually had a breakdown because he was recruited by Canadian spy agency. Okay. And, um, the brothers that he was trying to get dirt on were just really nice, good brothers. And he just felt so guilty for what he was doing. He literally had a mental breakdown. Like he tried to commit suicide at one point. He was oh, Allah. Oh. Do you understand know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, and this is the type of people that they recruit in the first place. People who are somewhat a little bit mentally unstable. So there's like yeah. this hidden, whether it's that extreme example or just the general now disposition of our community as like a you know mental health professional. Do, what do you see as like the hidden um, damage that is being done to our community? Oh man, Paula, I mean Barclafik. Now I think you're touching on like a core issue of mine um, that, you know, I think it it preoccupies me a lot. And I'll be frank with you, I don't have many people to speak with about it because I think there's also an apprehension to even talk about this issue at all, right? Um, People who have been critical of counter-extremism, at least in the UK, you know, by like someone like Sajid Javid, um you know, politician, you know, he sort of made sly remarks that people who are critical of counter-extremism are themselves potentially extremists. And I've, I've, I've been told that, you know, to my face at, in like several, in several different uh, occasions. I mean, look, I want to, I just want to maybe raise two things. I think the first thing is the thing that you're talking about in terms of the impact. Um, you know, I want to, I just want to make a quick Full circle because you know we, we we began talking about depoliticization. Isn't that the most quintessential form then of Islamophobia? That depoliticization that people are so um, 
you know, they're so invested in self-surveillance, right? In really trying to filter their thoughts. They're, they're, you know, can I talk about Palestine or not? You know, can I, can I, can I speak out against Israel? Can I, can I, can I say this? Can I say that? That is the fullest impact of Islamophobia, which we rarely ever talk about, is that depoliticization, that people are reluctant to share their political thoughts. And um, really, that's, that's a reflection of society, first and foremost. I mean, that most non-Muslims, who, anyone who'd be listening in on this, would recognize immediately, you know, that, oh, no, this can't, that can't be, that can't work as a society, that like segments of a society can, are, are so apprehensive of, of, of sharing their thoughts, right, are so depoliticized. Mm-hmm. But in terms of also in terms of mental health, so there's an emerging theme called affective surveillance. So affect is like emotion, right? So there's like this emotional sort of experience. We're constantly in the state of like anxiety, which can be maybe also then just restated as uncertainty, right? Am I being seen? How are my statements going to be conveyed to my teacher, to my doctor? You know, the knocking on the door, you know, a mother was telling me, Paula, like, you know, when just knocking at the door, the daughter, for some reason, is so afraid that someone's going to come take her father away. She just goes and runs and hides in the closet. You know, I've had brothers and sisters, and it's, it's been quite a weight on my shoulder, I'll be honest, but, you know, I've had brothers and sisters, um, many come to me right now, especially because of the PREVENT policy, and I'll just explain it very quickly. PREVENT is a statutory policy in uh, all public settings in the UK, whereby... Um, Staff, you know, teachers, doctors have to have, you know, have their due diligence in referring based on their gut feelings, people they suspect may be vulnerable to radicalization, i.e. terrorism in the future. Right. So it's pre-crime. If they get the gut feeling that someone might potentially in the future Mm. become radicalized, be vulnerable to radicalization, they um, have a duty to refer them. Mm. Um, so I won't go that far into it, into like how that works, etc. It's just to explain that when brothers and sisters now become or are made aware of it. So a lot of people generally sometimes um, are still slowly being made aware that it's happening in mental health settings here. But when they do become made aware of it, I mean, where, where do they turn to now? You see, it's like this, you see, it's just all these compounding factors. So through Islamophobia, affected surveillance, you know, they're already anxious. They don't know who to speak to. Sometimes they're not so sure who they can trust, okay? Now, let's pretend there's other things going on in their lives. There's stress. You know, things are bringing them down. Now, ideally, they need to speak with someone. They're unsure, potentially, if they can go to random messages because, again, if certain messages of counter-extremism discourse have become normalized, they don't feel that's a safe space. Now, they also don't feel like they can go to a a regular mental health setting because they know that duty exists there. So I get brothers and sisters who are calling me who are like, look, you know, um, not because they have anything to hide. They're just so afraid that their general vulnerability, um, and I write about this because eventually what happens because it's a racist policy. So Muslims who are vulnerable, you know, anyone who sort of like, you know, has issues, they're like, ah, they're going to think I'm vulnerable to becoming a terrorist in the future, right? Yeah. And they're not yeah. going to go to a public setting to talk about it. And I think we as Muslims, or at least here in the UK, especially uh, Muslim mental health professionals, you know, I get sometimes people come to me, you know, even a non-Muslim might come to me and, and, uh, and want to speak with me just because I've been explicitly political, that, you know, I make it explicit that, like, I'm against these policies, mm. you know? And they would then admit they're not, they don't feel safe enough to go speak to a Muslim about it. Because if that Muslim hasn't made their position clear, maybe, maybe that Muslim psychiatrist is going to make a prevent referral against them. Mm. You see what I mean? And this is now yeah. thing, it becomes so insidious. Because when, you, when you're left then with, you don't know where to turn or who, or who to trust, mm. um, you're, you're basically creating all these fractures. I mean, that's what all these surveillance policies, that's their, that's their ultimate impact. There's all these fractures in, a ways, in, a, in ways that are ultimately managed by the state rather than a cohesive you know, sense of community that's based on trust. 
right? That's that's that. These are things that are being broken through these policies. Yeah, no, you're you're very correct in how insidious it can become. Like it just, it, it, subhanallah, it just eats uh, away at people. You know, just that idea of uh, you know not even being able to trust speaking. You know, having to be always self-regulate, self-police yourself. Yeah. You know, thinking, oh, is this going to be controversial? Is this going to cause me to lose my job? Is this going to cause me to get in trouble? You know, th- th- this is, I think, leading us down a path where you do get people who just snap. And it's like, I never saw this coming. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. of course you didn't see this coming because this guy was just showing you what you what he thought the world wanted to see all this time. And you can't live that duality. It becomes like in two different directions and there reaches a point where things snap. You know yeah. what I mean? And, you know, whether it's like, you know, self-harm or it's externalized, um, you know, I think what's the stated intention of a lot of these programs has a reverse effect. They do not foster um, a, uh, I would say, a more peaceful and tranquil society. You know what I mean? It actually moves you towards a more suspicious fearful you know anxious you know type of uh environment within society you know absolutely I mean? man. absolutely it's ha, ha, have you w- like now because you have a good uh, perspective in uh, b- both europe europe and canada yeah. in terms of islamophobia which is the country that you feel that muslims have the biggest challenge with islamophobia and um uh, and, and and what and what has your experience been now with I guess uh, amongst these uh, some of these countries that that uh, you've lived in? So what, what would you say is the the best case scenario that you found like yourself personally living, you know, uh, in, in dealing with Islamophobia, and what's been the more challenging one? You know, I get that question all the time, um, yeah. which is funny because I think we're all trying to gleam like, <laughs> you know, all right, sorry, because it's. If the apocalypse is going down, you know, just tell me where to move, right? You know, you know, I, I uh, wouldn't necessarily apocalypse, but I would say if 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 someone if a community is doing something right, yeah. we can learn from them, and if a community is struggling, we can also learn from them. Yeah, uh, that's what I would say is the what we could extract from that. Because yeah, no, absolutely. If the apocalypse is going down, man, just go to Medina. <laughs> go to Medina. <laughs> Medina. That's it. I mean, my friends, we talk about buying farmland outside of Ottawa. Um, I don't know if yeah. that essentially just answers your question. But look, yeah. uh, actually, my PhD was on that. So my PhD was comparing yeah. political context. I was comparing um, the impact of political context of, of Quebec and Germany and Denmark on Muslims, on Muslims mm-hmm. in particular. And, um, you know, I'll be honest with you, man. It's, it's, there's, no, there's no black and white answer to this. No, I obviously there's some countries that are clearly just very like I mean a very explicitly Islamophobic. So you're obviously never going to hear from me like that if we're going to make a list, we wouldn't put China on top, you know, or whatever. Yes. Uh, you know, may Allah bless our brothers and sisters who are oppressed in all these countries. Um, but you know, in the across the global north, what what becomes really uh, what becomes difficult to glean has a lot to, it's not just about like what politicians say, you know, but it has a lot to do with history, you know, colonial legacies and trajectories, you know, a lot of, you know, a lot of the Muslims in the UK, obviously were, you know, um, you know, a long time ago were, were Muslim or were colonial subjects, you know, I mean, that's not the same sort of legacy that existed among Muslims um, in Canada. For example, um, so it, you know, history plays a really big role, especially if we're just talking about like the, the significance of col- coloniality, because in terms of laws and legislations, all these things still play a role, right? Okay, so that's one factor, uh, but you know, another factor is is uh, I think to me, to what extent you know, countries can recognize at all the significance of racism, for example. And you, that might sound weird, but Denmark, for example, is super racist. <laughs> it's really racist, right? I mean, Denmark has a policy 
called the ghetto policy. And in that ghetto policy, they differentiate between literally what they say, Western and non-Western people. And by that, they mm-hmm. specifically mean Muslims. So now mm-hmm. they designated just recently, um, you know, a few years ago, certain pockets in, in Denmark to be ghetto zones that live, the people, the Muslims that live in these zones actually live under a second tier justice system. Like mm-hmm. if they were to do something, you know, any sort of mistakes or things that they would, 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 to, uh, would do, it would uh, be worse off if they didn't live in that ghetto area. I mean, officially designated. Um, you know, obviously, it's incredibly racist. And often I tell people to read up on it because, you know, you know even with some uh, NGOs, there was, a, there was a head of an NGO, a really big NGO. And I was sitting next to him, you know, we're drinking coffee. And he's kind of just being exposed to all of this right now, the ghetto policy. And he's like, what the hell is going on? <laughs> like, he's yeah. like, you know, this is something you wouldn't think is happening in 2020, right? Yes. But this is what's happening to our Muslim, to Muslims right now in Denmark, you see? Mm. At the same time, Muslims in Denmark don't, aren't, um, don't experience perhaps that same sort of, to the same extent, that sort of economic deprivation that Muslims in other uh, countries might experience, you know, uh, whatever, like, uh, you know, some, some pockets in the UK and uh, in France, you know, some pockets in France, in France, pockets yeah. in France, et cetera. So, you know, because Denmark has, well, whatever, I mean, I don't want to get into its, its, its policies, but it's like a pseudo socialist country. So, that mm. social mobility to be able to rise in ranks just because all these things are afforded to you um, is also still available for Muslims, right? Mm. So how do you how do you how do you weigh these things out? I think mm. ultimately, um, you know, uh, what the the truth of the matter is that there is no easy answer to this. But if I were to just give my opinion, I would I would say that Canada for me stands out. Mm. Um, as well as, and by Canada, I mean, and I don't mean Canada, <laughs> because mm. we can't really compare like Saskatchewan with like whatever, you know, um, like Toronto or something, you know, like I think we're talking about certain areas, you know, I think we need to start talking about certain communities. I think that's yes. the best way to phrase it, you know, not mm. countries. Think about communities, you know, the Toronto community, the London community, the Manchester mm. community, you know, mm. the potentially the Montreal community, even though Quebec has, you know, all its own unique history and policies and politics and insecurities. That's, I think, a better way to phrase it. If anyone is going down that route of like, okay, where should I move? Um, it's better to think about communities. And there you might then already first ask yourself, well, how invested am I in my own community where I am right now if I, if I don't feel good? You know, mm. like maybe that will make a really quite a significant impact. In, in the way you feel, because that sense of solidarity that I'm part of a community, you know, I'm engaged, I'm not by myself. That's, it's the isolation that kills us, you know, mm-hmm. through all Islamophobic sort of uh, policies and rhetorics that are unique and different across countries, but increasing just more generally across the world. Yeah. Are, you're aware of this uh, in Quebec, the Bill 21? Yes. And it, uh, like... Most, I feel, um, uh, most of these policies that they, when they try to um, marginalize Muslims, they always start with their sisters. Because I think, like, you know, this, this bill obviously primarily affects Muslim sisters above everyone else. Because this, this beard hasn't been turned into a religious symbol yet, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So, so as a as a mental health professional like what what effects are you seeing with our sisters uh who try are trying to wear a hijab and then uh they're almost on they become like a lightning rod now right with um a lot of these issues like they're because they become the focal point yeah man subhanallah i mean first of all i should say you know i want to give a shout out to to many of the sisters out there you know i think there's a lot of sisters who can answer this question in in, in far more de- detail and eloquence than i ever could we have a lot of mm-hmm. mashallah very inspired and eloquent uh, and intelligent sisters who have written about this 
you know, and uh, I just want to acknowledge all their work because any answer that I have really also comes off their backs, you know. Um, there's a sister, for example, a lecturer, like an assistant professor here. She was explaining how one third, you know, people don't notice, but here in terms of um, the, the, the cases that come up to the European court, so cases that are always taking up, up and up, one third of all the cases, I think, uh, within a certain time span, I can, I can get the reference specifically, of all those cases dealt with niqab and the niqab mm. ban. I mean, can you imagine that? Right. Mm. It, it's, it's quite wild uh, and well recognized how much uh, the Muslim female body really is sort of like the, the battlefield of like, mm. you know, of. Um, the war on immigration, the war on terror, you know, if Muslims are going to integrate or not integrate, you know, it's usually Muslim women who bear the brunt of that. And I think, unfortunately, I think brothers um, are slow to really appreciate the significance of that. I mean, in terms of mental health, I'll be honest with you, man. I mean, I'm surprised there must be some kind of baraka or, you know, there's something, there, there's some ayah in this, there's some miracle in this, that, you know, more sisters aren't taking off their hijab, given how bad it actually is, if you really think mm. about it, you know. I think we, we're all, we might be looking at the glass half empty when we think about it, you know. I think there's an incredible resilience among, uh, among sisters, um, you know, that, um, you know, despite not only the state telling them, you know, a lot of sisters, they come to me, for even even among clients or working in the Muslim community, that, you know, they admit that, you know, it's not only just this law, it's this policy, you know, my dad gave into it, you know, my dad keeps telling me to take off my hijab, you know, yeah. I mean, that, that, that's something we, we were like, imagine how suffocating that is. Mm. Um, uh, SubhanAllah, I mean, I'll be honest, um, I mean, I think I'll maybe just leave it at that because I think in terms of the general impact, I think sisters have it bad, not only in terms of hijab, and I don't think we should necessarily just focus on hijab. You know, a recent research just came out, a study in the UK discovered that among South Asian uh, women, they were the least likely to get a job in accordance to their education. So depending on how they, they were educated, they're least likely to get a job in accord in accordance to that. And there was another study a long time ago that actually also found that Muslim women here in the UK were some of the most highly educated subgroups of all of all of all communities. Mm. So, you know, I mean, if we just even just take that detail, that's not necessarily about the hijab, but if you think about how mm. Muslim women are sort of marginalized and ostracized and they're 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 just sort of, they're banned from so many different spaces, um, you know, and then we question why they might take off the hijab. We might have a fuller understanding when we have a fuller appreciation of actually what is actually happening to them. Um, and I think that's, that becomes an onus on us on, on a, as a community to be able to, to recognize the unique, very gendered ways that what Muslim women are going through. Um, that um, that's really, really significant to the experiences of marginalization, to the stress, etc. Mm. Uh, one thing uh, I've noticed, um, like myself, I'm not too big on social media, but from what my students um, share with me, is um, another, um, I guess, dimension to this is uh, social media and uh, you know the perception that they can that they have on social media, or sometimes how um, they themselves engage and they're engaged with. And so, um, something that's come to light recently is um, certain sisters will develop like this big social media following. They wear hijab, and then uh, you know most of I think their audience is probably Muslim, and then all of a sudden they take off their hijab, right? So they found especially some of the younger sisters they've said that that's actually been more detrimental that they found amongst the muhajibat in the community than like these external 
you know, people who are saying, oh, take off the jab and or we're going to make these policies or even their parents. Mm-hmm. Because they almost feel like these. this is our peer group. Like, you know, this has been almost a greater fitna for them. Yeah. Uh, you, you know what I mean? Have you seen uh, some of this uh, come up as well? So I'm not super engaged on social media, I should admit that as well. Yeah. Um, you know, in some groups that I'm a part of, um, I think this has been raised. Um, I, I'll be honest with you, I think this requires a lot more thought, and I think especially more input from sisters, you know. I think, mm. again, a lot of sisters have, have sat down with this issue. Um, mm. and I, I think in, in more sort of empirical detail, you know, have done a lot more research with it. And I think, you know, their, their voices are necessary here more than anyone else's. Um, so I can't really say because, see, I'll, I'll be honest with you. Here's, here's an issue that we're always facing, okay? When, we, when we're exposed to these issues, to what extent is it um, a moral panic? Or let's, let's begin with the, the, the state where I think people are often discussing it, which is this is, this is uh, a real crisis. Okay, this is a crisis in faith. You know, people will come in and say, you know, whatever, it's feminism. All these ideologies are infiltrating uh, the Muslim community. Um, and so there's a crisis of the Muslim mind, so to speak, and we need to protect the Muslim mind. That's, in a way, I'm, I'm really reducing it to that. Obviously, it's a lot more complex. Mm-hmm. There's a counter opinion, potentially, that, again, this might be a moral panic because our only way of registering issues in the community happens to focus on Muslim women. You know what I mean? Um, and to give an example of that, you know, we're not then fully registering to how much, let's say, premarital sex is happening among guys. You know, for all we know, it might have increased tremendously. But we're actually completely oblivious to that. I'll be honest with you, that's also my kind of gut feeling. I mean, I'm, I'm rarely seeing Muslim clients, male clients, that haven't engaged in premarital relations at this point. Mm. It's, becoming, it's becoming so uh, ubiquitous, but it's also, for some reason, it doesn't touch that moral panic button in the community. Um, because as, you can't see it, you know what I mean? It's not like, you know, you saw that sister, it's a very... You know what I mean? Like a uh, superficial way of being able to say, oh, they're not working this job anymore. Because unless the guy comes in with like covered in tattoos or something that's more visual, yeah, you know, then yeah. That's, I mean, that's, that's definitely one explanation. Yeah. That's exactly yeah. it. I think, I think yeah. that's just one uh, element of it, right? Like yeah. why is it that – I think we need to always take a moment and ask ourselves, is this, is this, is this a real crisis or is there, is there a way of explaining how this could be a moral panic? that you know belongs to a wider logic of like okay it's about muslim women you know muslim women's body maybe we're replicating the discourse you know the Mm. politics is all about controlling muslim women's like bodies and what they can wear and maybe in our state of insecurity my my perspective of coming at this is is more looking at the entire uh community because uh, on the same token, what I would say is that the the people, it, well, at least in our communities here in Western Canada, the most active people in Dow are sisters, way more active now than the brothers. And that's mm-hmm. where that's the trend has completely changed in the past 20 years. 20 years ago, way more brothers involved, majority brothers, not as many sisters. Now, uh, it's way the majority of sisters that are involved in the, in the Dow. So, uh, and I would say in a, in a lot of sense, just being straight up, like they're tougher in the Dawa sometimes. Like mm. it's different because like, like I said, um, back in the days, like um, brothers were quite tough, like in terms of being able to manage life. You understand what I'm saying? Like yeah. manage life. Like my, my all, all my friends were like living on their own, working, volunteering, going to school full time, you know what I mean? We're doing our own laundry, like we were living, like you were survivors, right? Yeah. But now it's like, it's changed. It's like, okay, maybe the sisters, because they've always had that level of responsibility, they can multitask, you know, more. So traditionally they're, they're still kind of, uh, maybe they're more resilient in that sense. 
But when I'm looking at, I'm looking at a, 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 a total in a, in a total sense because that mm-hmm. sister, for example, taking off her hijab, is not only affecting sisters, yeah. it's affecting brothers too. Yeah. Do you understand what I'm saying? So uh, it's it's like you know when you recognize somebody as like they're recognizable as a Muslim, and then you see them now almost discard uh, what makes Muslim about them. It doesn't matter if it's a brother or sister. I think it has a demotivating effect on everyone, you know, who's who's trying to practice. You know what I mean? I I agree with you. I mean, look, I'm not I'm not saying there's no impact on this, and obviously, yeah. um, you know, I think you know may Allah protect us. You know, of being in the limelight, you know, may 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 he shield our mistakes from the public. You know, um, I think that I think there's no, um, you know, I I I don't I don't mean to dispute that reality. That obviously, if especially sisters, if they have a lot of followers, you know, they're they're role models eventually, and that's that's just the reality that we have to agree with. But I, I think, see, I think here, look, the point that I think I'm trying to say is you know, to what extent this necessitates that level of, okay, this requires potentially a community response, you know, like maybe this can be something whereby it's like, okay, you know, um, instead of 300 people writing about this issue now and talking about it, you know, and almost then sensationalizing it past the whatever issue it actually is. Right. So let's pretend it's an issue at the value of like five. Right. But everyone talking about it, you know, magnified that issue to like the point of 75, you know, uh, and a sister recently has made the point of like, let's pretend now um, I'm, I'm making this point. I mean, I'm taking I'm 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 re regurgitating her point of like mm-hmm. sexual allegations among um, among Muslims, Muslim males mm-hmm. in, in positions of power. Um, which, I mean, I, I think I might agree as well, doesn't potentially, uh, provoke that, that moral panic at the same time. Right. And there was a, there was a recent example of that whereby, I don't know if you, if you follow this, I mean, you're not following social media, but a brother on, um, on a channel, on a Muslim channel, (laughs) He uh he made some really like I mean really really like dirty and like derogatory remarks towards women. Mm. Uh, and this is this is on TV, right? Mm. Um, so he's talking about Muslim women in a particular way, and the way it was handled was just like you know kind of like brushed aside or you know, and then it's like oh they they apologized and. You know, um, boys will be boys and all these various forms of logic. You know what I mean? I mean, my point is what inspires moral panic and what doesn't? Mm. That, that's the point. Is this, is this worthy of a crisis that, mm. you know, okay, let's say a, a, a famous Muslim woman takes off her hijab. I think what we need to do as a community is find a way to really come together instead of it being one of like, you know, like it's, it's all left up to social media, <laughs> you know, it's like yeah. and by social media, it's all left to, up to like political contingencies, right? It's all left to yeah. so many other contingencies that will either magnify certain issues or like not magnify certain issues Where, whereby we have the human resources. We have the researchers, man, subhanAllah, sometimes I'm sitting back there. I tell my wife, uh, she, she's an academic as well um, and she's part of like all these sisters groups and academics and I'm like oh like you know we, we got to know many Muslim academics and researchers and they don't have to be academics I mean they can just be in the community they're incredibly incredibly intelligent enlightened you know like these are my role models and mentors we have so many subhanAllah you know like how yes. is it that like we always end up on these boats where we're like we're just like drifting off we're like responding to all these moral panics when we could easily just invest in like, okay, you know what? There seems to be a crisis here. Let's pay these four researchers to really sit down and like research the extent, the impact of what just happened. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Is this a true crisis? Are there other crises that actually warrant 
far more attention than this. Mm. You know what I mean? I think it's this lack of this, this sort of consolidated effort or discussion on issues which to me is always striking. That's why when it comes to these subjects, you know, like I think like Baraklafik, I think it really opened a really important topic, at least in terms of why I find um, these things, we need, to, we need to talk about them. But I think we need to also like recognize the limits of our ability to talk about them because we just simply don't understand the extent of the crisis or the impact on the community or how we might potentially be very unjust in like, diminishing or reducing real other crises that are happening yeah i think the the the, um the question becomes striking that balance you know between um inaction and um you know assessing too much and then understanding that uh and then going to the other end of the extreme where okay you're you're just trying to diagnose on the spot you know, uh, very, very superficially with, with, with that hijab issue for me, for myself, like being in the Dawah, uh, you know, for many years, mm. I just feel that that is just endemic for some core causes. So it's, and that core cause can manifest itself different for a sister. It can manifest itself differently for a brother, you know, for somebody who's older, who's some, who, who's somewhere, uh, someone who's younger. So it's like, you know, I guess it's just my clinician mindset where I look at, I don't, uh, I just observe the symptoms, but I'm looking at core causes. Mm, mm, you, mm. you know what I mean? Yeah. And, um, and, and so, uh, when I'm looking at, you know, this, whether it's like, you know, the, you know, the brothers who's in a sister who's in the way, and by, and by the way, for both brothers and sisters, you could have a brother who outwardly looks very, very practicing, but inwardly is very far from the dean, you know, maybe maybe very close to nifak. Same thing with the sister; could be wearing hijab very, very far. So, mm. uh, for me, that's a very poor metric necessarily. Just the outward appearance of a of a person, yeah. right? So, but when we're look for, uh, you know, if I'm trying to protect my community, uh, you know, and you know, as a father myself, you're looking at okay, what are the threats out there? Yeah, you, you know what I mean. And I'm a firm believer that it's better to uh, chase health rather than, uh, you know, chasing treatments all the time. Yeah. Okay, this is how we're going to treat this disease. How we, so it's better to, you know, chase that health. So uh, for, for, um, for, the, for, especially for the youth, um, that, I, that, that idea of having a strong identity, you know, um, it be, it does become muddled. I think it, it does become problematic the, given the political discourse. Like, where do I fit in? Do I fit in uh, in a tradi- from a traditional uh, perspective from my parents' generation? Do I fit in from like I'm trying to fit in maybe with like a new uh, activist movement? You know, in, in my community, like a non-Muslim activist movement. So there's inherent uh, you know issues that come up there. So for a lot of people, it's like, who am I? Like, yeah. you know, how do I, how do I fit in? You know, this, this, this sister that I was getting inspired for, for many like years, all of a sudden now takes off her job. Who am I? Yeah. Do, you, do you understand what I'm saying? Uh, and so I think that's more of a, you know, a core issue where I think, like you said, like thinkers, imams, academics, we need to sit down and, and talk about how do we make that identity um, stronger so that you know if a strong wind comes it doesn't knock it down yeah you, you know what I mean? absolutely it, it, it's it's really it's really interesting because it touches uh on, on a very personal note um you know look we can hypothesize one thing i i can potentially hypothesize one thing okay like we can ask ourselves the question why is it that our our sisters and our brothers they look up to these celebrities Right. So, mm-hmm. I mean, even if we were just to focus on sisters, you know, if we were just going to stay that in that place, I mean, well, listen, why the brothers like let's like, you know, for brothers, they um, say you, you uh, Muhammad Salah, say if he now does something wrong in the future or whatever. Right. That's it. Or That's anybody it. like, you know, any type of celebrity you can look up to or a YouTuber. And some of these YouTubers, they started off with like just funny, you know, Muslim skits. And then it yeah. became like really gross. 
Like yeah. it turned into being like really, really gross stuff afterwards, right? Absolutely. So yeah, I, I think the reason why I went back to like making a gender differentiation is because I think mm -hmm. essentially there is a gender difference in like maybe the issues. But I think I think absolutely yeah. that's what we need to do, right? Like we need to sort of figure out and have a better understanding of these sort of role models. Uh, why them? You know, um, and I think there's a lot to be said there. Uh, but I was just thinking about one thing, man, Pamela, because I think one sister mentioned about her daughter. So like the sister took off that hijabi influencer. She took off her hijab, and um, the sister had mentioned in a, in a group that um, her daughter had looked up to her or whatever it might be. And then the sister mentioned, well, why don't you go follow someone else? And the sister then, uh, her daughter had mentioned or at, responded that there was no one else to follow. Right. Mm. There was just like there was no one else wearing hijab to follow. Right. Mm. Um, so that I, I think about that for my daughter. Um, mm. Subhanallah, man, I'll be honest with you. When I came to East London, <laughs> there's 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 a number of messages here, um, which actually don't have a sister section. It led to a really awkward. Uh, it led to an awkward moment where there was a. A fairly big message that I went to it was really nice. I remember the first time I came to it, you know, it's it's big. And I told my wife, look, you got to check out this message. It's really nice. Mm -hmm. And then we came and like, we're sort of looking for the sister's entrance, uh, the sister side entrance. And, mm -hmm. you know, I never even thought, it never occurred to me that there might not yeah. be a sister's entrance, right? Yeah. And... Um, you know, I asked the brother, and the brother was really awkward. I, I felt like he he recognized, like, oh, this is this is a problem. But like, he's like, yeah, we don't decide. I then, over the years, I recognized a lot of women are actually just sitting in the cars, waiting outside for the men to finish prayer. So mm -hmm. if you see all the cars sort of lined up outside on the street, a lot of them mm -hmm. are just packed full of like, I mean, there's sisters just waiting. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, at another message, you don't find that in Canada at all, though. Every, I, I haven't seen a Canadian masjid yet that doesn't have a, a sister section. Maybe there's a masala, maybe small masala, but I've never seen a masjid here yet. Yeah, I mean, I think I think there's 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 a different level, right? And I think mm -hmm. that level, like once we went to pray, uh, and I'm telling you this, this like the, I'm, the reason I'm reflecting on this is because mm -hmm. I'm thinking about man, where do I have to move? You know, we're talking about part of being part of a community. You know, like I mm -hmm. can't. I can't live near this masjid because my daughter won't have any role models here mm. whatsoever. You know what I mean? I mean, she yeah. just simply think about every girl in one of those cars. Yeah. What kind of role models does she have? We're thinking about why is it that they're looking up to these hijabi influencers. And that's why there's like a yeah. gendered element potentially to it. That these yeah. sisters have literally no exposure to a community. And if they have exposure to community, you know, to what extent... These, you know, women are, you know, are given that 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 sort of um, uh, that investment, right? I mean, that mm. shared investment. It's both brothers and sisters, and there's gendered elements to it that are very significant. You know, I mean, mm. I, again, we went to another masjid, and one of the brothers said, uh, you know, in the set, you you know, the women pray at home, and I'm like, mm. Subhanallah, you know, like I'm just mm. trying to. Uh, I'm just mm. trying to find a place for my daughter. And I yeah. never, I, I didn't recognize this issue until I had a daughter. I mean, I recognized mm. it. Obviously, there's, there's documentaries like Unmasked, for example, right? Mm. Or other, other documentaries or, you know, chatter about and research really on like how Muslim women don't necessarily feel part of like Muslim communities or don't feel like they're part of the but What's Matt, the worst policy for ourselves? You, you know, you're, you're you're sabotaging your 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 now and your future. Yeah. You know, because all I can do is imagine all those you know sisters just on their smartphone watching God knows what video while you know people are praying inside. You know, you know what I mean? Like you're just sabotaging your that's whole it. your whole family, like your whole future is you're just sabotaging that. You did. You know, that's it. That's it. You know. Paula, and, I, mean, I, 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 I yeah. actually have to like, I have to tell myself I can't move here. You know what I mean? Like mm. it actually impacted where I'm going to move because I yeah. was living nearby, you know, yeah. and I'm like, I can't live here. 
But imagine people yeah. don't have that choice, that so that mobility, right? I had that mobility. Yeah. Imagine someone else now yeah. that little that little that little sister doesn't have it. Yeah. And what? Yeah. No, it's uh, I it, gen I think yeah. Generally speaking, uh, our community has very little role models, like especially those two um, that um, that pro- practice the dean like authentically, you know, um, but. You know the sisters, I think even more so. And uh, what I've found is that we've done so much to harm ourselves that you, you're just become easy pit- pickings for those people who try to manipulate the uh, Muslim community. Because what happens now is that you have the haters who say, "Okay, you guys don't have any role models in your community. We'll make one for you." Yeah, huh. and they do that. They do they- that, and and they fund certain people. Uh, yeah. Because they want a certain okay, you're not going to teach your your girls. We'll teach them for you, no problem. We'll take that over. We'll take over that responsibility. Yeah. And uh, you know, having myself having ha- having daughters, like um, absolutely everything. I, I want to take them to everything. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah. And I remember once, uh, like uh, like my daughter was very young, but I said, okay, you know what? I had to travel. Like I had to like uh, fly across the country. Uh, and, uh, you know, she was, she was pretty young at, at that time. I think she had to have been seven. So, uh, and I was getting, like, I was sitting down to get a and uh, collection of hadith. I said, okay, come with me. And so she witnessed the whole process. And t- to this day, she talks about it. Mashallah. To this day, she talks about, uh, you know, what happened and like you know, the hadith that she heard and everything that happened in that trip. So it has like a significant lasting impact, you know, on uh, on her development and her, and her mindset. And I think that's what we need to analyze it absolutely every in, in absolutely everything that we do in our community. What's yeah. what are we doing? Are we setting up our community for success? Are we uh, moving our community towards failure? You know, absolutely. Um, well. Being a psychologist as well, uh, because for, for you know, uh, in in Dawa here in the West. One of the things that we work on is self-development. That's the one thing mm. we always try to work on with the brothers and sisters here, self-development. And um, one uh, quality or characteristics traits or a set of quality and characteristics traits that's been identified by b- both Muslims and non-Muslims as being very praiseworthy, very important actually for success in any field. You know, uh, resiliency, uh, initiative, grit. You know, there's not a lot of now uh, work that's being published, books, you know, like even Angela Duckworth, grit, you know, uh, Stephen Covey, you know, resourcefulness and initiative. How can we develop this type of grit within our community? You, you know what I mean? Because I think that's what yeah. it's going to take for us, because we're not talking about making uh, just small little adjustments and we'll be OK. We, we <laughs> There is some like heavy duty boulders, you know, there's some big boulder in the, the, the trench of, uh, you know, Khandak that needs to be broken here. So um, how do we? How are we going to develop that type of grip within our community? Like, and I and I see this from the perspective that um, I'm really hard with the brothers sometimes. And and we had a discussion earlier too about how uh, you know there's a group of guys learning MMA and then you know it dwindled down over the month and stuff like that, right? Yeah. And and, and I, I'm a big proponent of like, okay, let's you know let we need to have a certain level of people push themselves, be resilient, because that's what we need, you know, in, uh, of our leaders in our community. So how can we develop uh, some grit uh, in our youth, uh, in our leaders, inshallah? Yeah, mashallah. Um, that's probably the golden question that uh, if podcasts had existed for hundreds and hundreds of years, you know, that would be... <laughs> yeah. I'm that asking you a be, good question, but maybe you yeah. give a few things, uh, uh, you know, that... <laughs> Advice is some nasiha, you know. Yeah, I mean, subhanAllah. Okay, let me just say this. Okay, I'm gonna start with I'm gonna start off with in a way that you probably really didn't expect, but I think it's just necessary um, to say um, as sort of a moral responsibility is that resilience is a very securitized term right now. I just want to say that very flat out. So it actually is is very prominent right now in counterterrorism policies. Uh, it belongs within uh, a. Um, a policy discourse or a, gov- a, a, a position of governance whereby through austerity, you want to cut back public funding 
mm. but you want people to have that grit that they don't break apart <laughs> when yes, we're just closing yeah. everything we're, we're you know they're going to become poor they're going to go mm. through a lot of like crap you know mm. uh mm. and that's why resilience in many ways um what people would say belongs to a, a neoliberal form of governance so that's that's we don't have to get into it but it's just to say that um, resilience has a lot of uh connotations and we have to i think first as muslims have to think about resilience towards what and what do we actually mean like we need to give depth to it right and we have to, i think also be very political in that in that we're not just replicating the ideal mm -hmm. form of like a productive muslim citizen who like despite mm -hmm. the fact that islamophobia is increasing and like all public yeah. spending and is, is is being cut that we're not like well, and, and I, I think that's a very important point that you're making is that by saying resiliency or grit or if we want to use Islamic terminology like a stakama or uh, you know having thabat um, we're not saying that we um, accept and are willing to go along with uh, status quo like okay. if changes are need to be made then we need to change that with also resiliency and grit inshallah okay. right yeah that's it, that's it. Uh, and so I just wanted to highlight that I mean I don't yeah, want to. No, I, think, I think you bring up a very important point because I, I do uh, see that as well on the horizon, uh, especially when you mention you know austerity and whatnot. That's a very good point that you know people should not get uh, double faked with. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, that's it. I think Subhanallah. I think yeah. we just need to be observant of that. I'm I'm writing about that actually. Um, as I, I think I had told you before we started this, I'm writing an article on politicizing Muslim mental health. Specifically, just to mm. sort of deconstruct these these concepts, just a little bit that we're yeah. we're aware of what we're talking about. Yes. Uh, because I should mention a lot of uh, Muslim organizations, like let's say you come up and you go to the government and be like, "Yeah, I got a resilience program for Muslims." It's like amazing. Here's like fifty thousand. <laughs> By the way, we used to invest like five hundred thousand in your community. Now here's fifty thousand just to you, so you take care of resilience for your entire community. And if people yeah. are not aware of that happening, then they fall into it yeah. because they think resilience just has yeah. to be a great thing always. Yeah. Um, yes. So I, I, I think like in terms of that grit and resiliency, I think, you know, one thing that you mentioned in terms of the activities and the dawah that you do. And if we even think about, um, you know, that, that, that when we're talking about right now about like hijab, you know, like or sisters, um, role models, you know. I'll be honest with you, I mean, I feel like everything I read about, like even like if you take it from history, if you take it from different communities, um, Muslim and non-Muslim, you know, just around the world, I think, you know, really it comes down to, to working together on like the issues that really matter to us. You know what I mean? Like, I think when we're talking about resilience, we need to like explain, well, what are the things that are hurting us in the first place? Like, obviously, as Muslims, we can set out certain ideals that we all agree with. Yeah, we want to make sure that we have that taqwa and whatever, you know, like we have a list of things that are important. I think those things can be elaborated on much more, like in terms of like whatever our political capacity and things like that. But then when it comes to the things that are hurting us, you know, I think um, I think we we rarely have a full grasp of what it is that that is hurting us what needs to be done um and i think there to me as i was about to say it really comes down to the sense of community that you're part of something and i'll be honest with you i think in a way that touches also very significantly on mental health um you know we have spoken about this before and I, you know, that just that element of people coming together, feeling like they're seen, you know, that they're actually seen, that they're actually heard as part of a community. You know, there's a sociologist, his, he goes by the name of, um, of Bauman. I'm not going to drop names. I, I also really, uh, I'm against people always dropping names. But, you know, I, I think he especially just made a point that I just maybe can flag to listeners. You know, he mentioned one of the things about modernity is that we went from communities to networks. That's one of the transformations, you know, we're, we're not, we're no longer a community with like a heart, a, like a living, breathing mm. community, you know, mm. but we're rather like a network of individuals. We all have our mm. families and things like that. And I think mm. inherently there's that 
isolation, there's that deprivation, you know, there's things that people might be going through that no one really recognized. And I think if we, if we want to develop, if we have a sense of that resilience, um, we need to reawaken a form or a sense of community, I think, mm. that um, is far more profound than mm. just like a network of things or just like a certain number of events or things like that, you know? Mm. Um, to that, like things that maybe really address people's needs, you know, at the heart of a community, mm. something that really a- addresses issues of poverty, you know, issues of education, things like that, that the community takes responsibility for its issues. We have the financial resources for these types of things. You know, we have the human resources. But um, for many reasons, you know, we haven't developed that sort of infrastructure. And I think that sort of infrastructure mm-hmm. will make a big difference in that sort of resilience. You want that grit. Imagine knowing that no matter how hard I go or how hard I try, you know, I have, I have, a, I have people to fall back on. Right mm-hmm. now, in the back of everyone's mind, you know, if I rock the boat too much, I'm all by my, you know, I'm going to fall mm. back. I'm gonna, they're going to kick me off the boat, you know, like mm. I said, spoke out against counterterrorism uh, in, in her health care uh, during, uh, in, in, in the, in, um, in the hospital. Um, you know, a bunch of non-Muslims came to her and told her like, oh, sorry, she got referred for speaking out. So she got a complaint was lodged against her for speaking out against the training. And a lot of non-Muslims came up to her and offered her solidarity and said, like, we're with you, like, we're with you, we see what you're going through, mm-hmm. you know. And her, not, her Muslim colleagues told her, why did you rock the boat? Yeah. They're going to let her fall. You know what I mean? Yeah. And we let people fall all the time, man. I mean, we got mm-hmm. Muslim prisoners that no one wants to touch or talk about. I mean, 50 mm. Muslims here in the UK make 5% of the total population, but 15% of the, of the prison population. And we don't mm. talk about them. We don't think about them. We don't think about supporting them because, you know, in a state of insecurity, we don't want to think about, you know, what people consider are the worst of us. You know what I mean? I mean, we're talking about grit. I don't want to talk about middle class Muslims. I want to talk about the Muslims who are actually going through issues. You know, mm. how do we support them? And there, I think we're going to see a flourishing from the grass that goes up to everyone who else, everyone else is going to benefit from. Mm. Um, so I think that's, that's just one way of potentially looking at it. But obviously, it's far more complicated than that. Yeah. But you'll need, uh, you, you will need people who are willing to put themselves on the line to get that change. You know, yeah. uh, that's, that's always been the case historically any revival in the Muslim community, it's always a few people who have that type of, you know, in the face of these huge odds, you know, so, um, but you're, you're absolutely correct. We, we, this is one of the ways that I think that we, we do have a power to change our communities. Um, but, uh, the question becomes whether or not we can leave individualism aside because it will take sacrifice. It takes sacrifice of time Take yeah. sacrifice of effort. So, for example, like the masjid issue you were talking about, it's going to take time and effort, right? Like if people, someone will have to sacrifice. Okay, we don't. Uh, we we need to make an addition for the masjid. What do we need to do, right? That somebody has to be able to say this is what needs to be done, and there's it's not going to be conveniently done. It's not going to be like someone's not just going to hand you this golden goose, and you'll have all your problems solved. Yeah. So, and and that's the, the you know, when I look at it, especially from, with our students and a lot of the DAO that we're doing here, is that um, you, we have to almost, the, the leaders who are going to affect this change have to hold them up to a higher standard, but I absolutely agree with you that we need to have a crew to have each other's backs. That is absolutely, like how many people have spoken the truth and have stood for something and they were so isolated that yeah. you didn't hear their voices again. And you never uh-huh. heard that message, uh, you know, being perpetuated again. And I think if you look at the seerah of our Rasul Sallallahu I think one of the wisdoms that we see of the stages of da'wah, so when you have the stage of da'wah where there was uh, the private da'wah, it wasn't public, 
you had this intensive training of the Sahaba عنهم, who after this training were now developed to become inshallah the Khulafa Rashidun you know to continue yeah, so it's not like you lose it's not like okay if you lost a Rasul وسلم, that now the message will stop the community will stop Yeah, you know what I mean so uh, because at the at the end of the day, especially those core Sahaba really had each other's backs. They really supported Rasul They were supporting uh-huh. each other, and they could have very different opinions, especially amongst you know the, the Sahaba. They could have you know completely different idea about how to move forward, but that did not become the impetus for them to break apart. You yeah. know, to to leave one another in the lurch. You know. Yeah, and uh, you know, ho- hopefully, we can uh, you know get beyond you know get to that stage. We can get to a stage where we do have at least a community that uh, you know supports one another, and we can address some of these issues and problems that you're talking about because we become very easy pickings, right? For um, you know others who you know, who would like to take advantage of us, like you know, you look at whether it's the talent, whether it's money in our community, we have it. We have yeah. talent. We have res- financial resources. Uh, we have very wealthy Muslims. We have skills. Uh, you know, we have the numbers. You, you, you know what I mean? Yeah, but why is it that, you know, we haven't been able to have this type of political change, this type of communal change? You know what I mean? So I think these are some good conversation questions that we've got to continue upon. Inshallah, it was great to have you on. Uh, Dr. Uh, Yunus, inshallah, we, we hope to have you on again and uh, continue some of this discourse and uh, keep maybe challenging some status quo. How does that sound? <laughs> it sounds great. And count me in whenever you want to do that, inshallah. <laughs> all right. <laughs> is that all I have It was our pleasure. And uh, inshallah, for our viewers, uh, our next um, podcast will be on Saturday. So remember, we always want to live by the haq, die by the haq, and just when you think life is stuck, tune into life haq. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Do I feel that the New York police are providing enough protection, or do I have to have protection of my own? I look for protection from Allah.